Open your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 1. <coughs> Many commentary writers on the book of Mark have said this, and, and I believe this. If you read the book of Mark correctly, you will be literally exhausted at the end of the book. Because the book is written in a way in which they are the snapshots of Christ. I mean, they just fly like a shutter speed on a camera. Bam, 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 bam. Now, just look in chapter one. Look at verse 10. Immediately coming out, coming up out of the water. Immediately. Look at verse 12. Immediately the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. Look at verse 18. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And it just continues on and continues on immediately, immediately. Then you get to 29 and immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with uh, James and John. Verse 30, now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Immediately, immediately, immediately. So what we're seeing here is Jesus never ceased to be God. But what he did, he did as a man in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was the last Adam who came to reverse the undoing of the first Adam. Then we get to a very, very important text in 32. When evening came, now this is after all the immediates. It says, and when evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered at the door and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Now. Um, I learned this from Leonard Ravenhill when he, when not anything he said, but when I would ever go and, and hear him preach when he would come to Fort Worth, I can't tell you that I remember a lot of the things that he preached, but the one thing that is ironed in my mind, I mean, it's just I can still see him. And something that the Lord has laid upon my heart is that after the sermon, the ministry begins in that I would see Leonard Ravenhill as an old man stand there for hours talking to people, especially young people. And I, if you've ever ministered in that way, a sermon is exhausting if it's preached with earnestness. When the spirit of God works through a person, it literally takes a toll on their physical well-being. And then for hours afterwards, hours, hours, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You literally crawl into bed. You are so exhausted. But look at our Lord. Look at his humanity. This is real humanity. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That doesn't mean he was sinful. It means he came with not a pre-fall Adamic body, but he came with a body that was susceptible to all the consequences of sin, the innocent consequences of sin, being tired, being buffeted, being broken, being able to die, to suffer. And so here we have a man in which the spirit of God is working through him with so much power. He's fighting not only the natural ills of the fall, he's fighting the demonic. He's doing everything. Virtue is going out from him. OK, uh, one time in Peru, I, I took a doctor with me and I was up in the northern mountains in a place called Santa Rosa. And um, he, he was a doctor. He's a very good doctor, but, you know, he could only bring a few things. You know, it wasn't like he had a surgery table with him. And I will never forget what happened. When the people, there were about 1,100 mountain men and women gathered there for the conference. Just dirt, dobie, you know, no running water. You know. 
And when they found out he was a doctor, these men and women who were so kind, they stood in line all day and all night to try to get to him. They had never, there was no doctor. And they were just trying to get to him, trying to get to him. And I saw them not like when we see this picture of Jesus working, I can imagine how a Renaissance painter would paint it. You know, all these people just peacefully waiting their turn to be ministered to. No, when need drives people, even good people can become aggressive. You know, they're tenacious. This is my only hope for my child. My child is sick. I don't know. And there's a doctor. They would wait for hours. That doctor literally for three days was shut up in an adobe thing from night till morning, morning to night, and people clamoring and standing outside trying to get in. He was so wore out that he couldn't even hardly walk. So that's the picture we have here. Here are people in absolute desperation. I mean, children that are demon possessed, others who are dying, others. You would do anything as a father and mother, even to the point of violence, even to the point of ripping a roof off a house. Right. So I want you to see here is the Messiah. Here is Christ. And he is literally just drained. But look what we see in the early morning, 35, while it was still dark. Now, see, he was ministering while it was still dark. And now it's still dark again. And now I am not saying to you, young ministers, that you're supposed to live every day with three hours of sleep. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what this text is saying. What this text is saying, though. Is that there's never a reason to leave off. Meeting with God. And sometimes, yes, you're going to go to bed at 1.30 and you're going to have to get up while it is still dark. Now, you can't live that way, but you must live a life of prayer. And it says, Jesus got up, left the house and went away to a secluded place and was there praying. Secluded place. Jesus loved people. But we often find him in a secluded place. Because if you never go to that secluded place, you will never be able to help one soul on this planet. It's the secluded place that make men and women able to be useful to the Lord. And he was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Oh. Are you so... Heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Don't you know there are people hurting? Don't you know there are babies crying? Don't you know there are people out there who need you and you have gone off? To have a devotional time. You see how this devil works. You see that. Young men, listen to me. Supposed reformed young men. Who've memorized the book of Romans and Ephesians and think there's no other part of the Bible. Who can talk and talk and talk all night about Calvin's doctrine of this and. Owen's doctrine of that. And you're a dime a dozen. I wouldn't even let you in the door of ministry. And that's what's wrong with this whole reform movement, and the young reform people and all this stuff. There's a difference about learning something from a book and learning something from the Bible, learning something in a library and learning something in the prayer closet. Now, you know me. I love old books. Mac would not let me be speaking like this. He loves old books. If he didn't understand what I was saying, not against books. But is this your life? You know, one of the worst things about young ministers, bachelor packs, I call them. They run in packs. Men of God don't run in packs. I was very fortunate that when I was converted, I went to a church that had an extraordinary man. No, he wasn't reformed. 
to this day, I've never heard anyone preach with his power. Never, never. And I remember he, when I sensed the call, I walked into his office. When you went into his office, this wasn't fake. He was just constantly praying. Even if he's walking around looking for a book in his library, he was praying. I mean, it was a constant. When I walked in, he said, son, sit down. And this is what he said to me. So you sense a call to the ministry? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you be alone? And I thought he meant, you know, if I preach the truth, no one would like me and I'd have to be alone. Which that is pretty much true sometimes. That's not what he meant. He was saying when all those other boys out there are running around in bachelor packs. Sitting at Starbucks or wasn't a Starbucks back then, but sitting at Starbucks and talking about theology. I'm kind of putting some contemporary context to his words. Can you be alone with God? Can you be alone with God for hours, boy? Do you see? Do you see? Sometimes I get so sick of preaching. Why? Talk, 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 talk. Words, 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 words. Platitudes, platitudes, emotions, emotions. Where's the power? So much talk, big talk. He was wore out. Yet look at our example. Look at our example. Look at our example. And went away to a secluded place and was there praying. And I could take you through the book. I could take you through the book of Luke, which is amazing. Luke's emphasis on the Holy Spirit. You know what else Luke emphasizes? Prayer, doesn't he? I mean, you can just go through there. I have a sermon where we just go through every place where you see Jesus praying. And, and, and that's what I want you to see, brethren. Now, I'd like to go right now and teach you on how to pray. But now I'm just I have time to tell you to pray. And if you want to know how to pray. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes we just seem to be so dull, so dull. People come at me all the time. How do you pray, Brother Paul? I said, do you realize there was only one time that Jesus was asked by somebody? How do you do something? Do you realize that? No one ever walked up to Jesus and said, how do you walk on water? Uh, how do you cast out demons? Not even how do you preach or teach us to preach? Didn't say that. I said, Lord, teach us to pray. And we think prayer is such a mystery. But he said, he said, OK, pray then in this way. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Did you see that? That's how you how do you pray? I wish we could break all that down. I show you that's how you order your prayer life. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow or something sometime or I don't know, I just. I want you to see it's really. You have to just recognize our savior needed this. In the servant songs of the Messiah. God said, I'll hold your hand. So he said to the Messiah, I'm going to hold you. Take you through all this. You're going to believe me. And it was prayer. Prayer. All right, Matt.